Today we're going to be reflecting on a passage from the Apostle Paul that powerfully reminds us of our new identity in Christ and the grace that brings us from death to life. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 is the is a cornerstone of the gospel message. It lays out for us the depth of our sin and the breadth of God's grace and the heights to which we are lifted in Jesus Christ. And it's a passage that speaks directly to the core of our faith. And that is that we are saved by grace through faith and not by our works. And Paul's message in these verses highlights this transformative power of God's love. And he speaks to us about the condition we were once in and our deadness in sin and his, the richness of his mercy and, it, and the resulting new life that we receive through Christ. And this text serves as a foundational one for our reformed heritage, particularly for us as Presbyterians, as it emphasizes God's initiative in salvation. So with that, let's read from Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's go to him in a brief word of prayer, and we'll dig in. Heavenly Father, be with us today as we study this weighty part of Scripture. And Lord God, open and illuminate our minds to the power of your Holy Spirit to understand <clears throat> and to trust in your word. Father, be with the one who speaks. He's a vile sinner, but he has a great Savior. Now, Father, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. In March of 2023, Ian Steger was snowboarding with three friends near his hometown on Mount Baker in, West, in western Washington state. And he got separated from his friends uh, because he was snowboarding in, a, in an area that was considered out of bounds because it was so heavily tree-lined and it was very, very narrow. And he ended up, going, while, he, while he was doing this, he fell into what's called a tree well. A tree well are areas of deep snow that can form around the base of trees and are serious risks to skiers and snowboarders. Falling into a tree well can lead to a fatal accident called snow immersion suffocation. And Ian fell upside down into the tree well and was quickly swallowed up in the collapsing snow. His arms were pinned uh, against him, one elbow against his body with his hand or by his face, and he could hear in his radio that his friends had no idea where he was, and he was unable to call them because he couldn't move his arms enough to press the button to press talk. And so he struggled to get out, but he simply sank deeper into the snow, and he knew he had about 15 minutes before he was going to suffocate and die. Meanwhile, Francis Zuber, a New York State native who had recently moved to the area, was navigating a path through the dense trees on skis. Uh, he's wearing a GoPro camera on his helmet. There is a video that you can find on YouTube. It's incredible. 
but there's a, he's wearing it on his helmet, and the video shows he could have gone in a bunch of different directions with hundreds of trees before him, leaving only a couple of feet between them. And Francis said this, he says, I was going faster than I would have liked, uh, particularly, he says, because he's not familiar with that area. So I kind of did that jump term to stop and sort of reset since I didn't know what was on the other side of those trees. I mean, had I not done that, I wouldn't have seen him. Seeing the bottom of a snowboard on top of the snow with feet attached, Francis knew that the person was in trouble and scrambled to clear enough snow to get air to the stranger on the snowboard. Ian was only about 10 feet away from Francis, but the snow was so deep that he was incredible difficult, incredibly difficult for Francis to reach him. And, and, and at first, he, he tried to sidestep through the snow, but he wasn't going anywhere. And so he used his pole to take off his skis, to use them to help him and to get up there so it would stabilize him as he pushed through to get to Ian. Six feet down, buried in snow, Ian heard nothing. He could move nothing. Buried alive, all he could think was contemplating his death. He said there was sadness there, but it was more acceptance. I just entirely accepted it, that this was how my life was going to end. And eventually, Francis got close enough to grab onto Ian's snowboard and started digging. And six feet down, he finally found goggles. And he pushed the snow away from his mouth. And he says, you okay? You all right? Okay, you're good. I got you. Can you breathe? And Ian answered, oh, yeah. And Francis said, all right, we're going to take a moment. We're going to catch our breath for a second, and then I'm going to dig you out. Is that okay? Thank you. Ian said. My brothers and sisters, I want to tell us that without Jesus Christ spiritually, we are all Ian. We are without a hope of saving ourselves, and therefore we are dead men walking, to borrow from another story, because of our state of spiritual death. Paul begins by painting this very stark picture of our state apart from God. He says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Paul doesn't say we were sick or that we were in need of assistance. He says we were dead. And this language of death is crucial because it underscores the severity of the separation from God. Sin has not merely wounded us. It has killed us spiritually. We are powerless, incapable of responding to God on our own because we are dead. And if you know your scripture, you know this powerlessness traces all the way back to Adam's fall. God had given Adam the warning of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You shall not eat it, for the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And this is one of the questions I get asked all the time. Hey, he ate the fruit. Why didn't he die? How could Adam keep living and living? But Scripture is clear that Adam... Though he continued to walk in the world physically, in the physical world which God had made, he passed from a state of spiritual life to a state of spiritual death when he sinned against God. And physical death would eventually come, and that death has been passed on to all of us. The human condition apart from Christ is this, is that we follow the patterns of this world, living according to our own desires and under the influence of spiritual forces that stand in rebellion against God. And, and Paul makes it clear that this was not the condition of just a few, but it is of all of us. Verse 3, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. And Paul, he uses the word we, it's first person plural. He is including himself in this. And the implication there is humbling. Apart from Christ, we are deserving of God's righteous judgment. We are not just morally neutral beings who occasionally make mistakes. We are rebels who have rejected God's rule and turned to our own ways instead. 
And there's no sugarcoating of this reality. It forces us to confront the depth of our need for Jesus. We cannot save ourselves because we are spiritually dead. Which leads to our next point, looking at the richness of God's grace. The campus minister that I worked under when I was an RUF intern told me this story, and apparently it's kind of a, a legend at the Reformed Theological Seminary circles. <clears throat> he was talking about a professor who was speaking on this passage, and he's got his entire class just riveted because they're holding on, and he's laying out kind of what I did, probably in much better fashion, of laying out the depth of how bad it is, how we are dead, and how much we need Jesus. And then my, my, my campus minister says, and then he turned to the class as they were all just riveted on the edge of their seats, and he says, don't you worry, though, because here comes God, excuse me, here comes Paul with his great big butt. And he lost the class and <laughs> dismissed. But God. Those two words signal a dramatic turning point. Not just in this passage, but in the entire narrative of human history. Verses 4 through 7, Paul describes the overwhelming grace of God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Romans 5 says, even when we were enemies, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. God's intervention was not because of anything we did or that we could offer. It was entirely motivated by his rich mercy and his great love. That phrase there, rich in mercy, is a beautiful expression of the depth of God's heart. He did not just show us, show us mercy, he lavished it upon us. His mercy is abundant and overflowing and never-ending. His love for us was so profound that while we were dead in our sins... He made us alive in Christ. This is the heart of the gospel, that God, in His grace, reached down to us when we could not reach up to Him. He did not wait for us to make the first move because we were incapable of doing so. Instead, God made the first and final move by sending His Son, Jesus, to die for our sins and rise again so that we might be made alive in Him. And Paul goes on to say that God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And this speaks to our new identity that we have in Christ. We are no longer defined by our sin and our rebellion. Instead, we are raised to new life and seated with Christ, meaning that we share in his victory and his glory. We are not just mere servants. We are his children. And this is the grace of God, that we who were once dead in sin are now alive and exalted in Christ. So that means we need to also answer the hard question. Why does God save some and not all? Scripture teaches that God's election is an act of his sovereign grace meaning that his choice is not based on anything humans do, but solely on his will and purpose. God is sovereign, and he is free to show mercy to whom he chooses. In Romans 9, he says, As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, if you go all the way back into the story of Jacob and Esau, you may think, oh, well, Esau must have been a, just a terrible person, and Jacob must have been pretty good. But if you read the story, Jacob's probably worse. There's nothing about the story in Jacob that's kind of redeeming. He steals things from his brother. He, he you know, kind of schemes against his father-in-law. He has multiple wives. But God says, Jacob I have loved. Exodus 33 he says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. 
And Paul continues, Paul quotes that in Romans 9, and he continues on saying, so then it depends not on human will or exhortation, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. And you may still think, that's not fair, that's not right, why? I hope this illustration makes sense. In my head, it makes sense, but I never know if, I'm gonna under, if y'all are going to understand what I'm trying to say. If I have a million dollars, and it's mine, it's mine, it's mine to do whatever I want to with it, and I decide I'm going to give it away, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to give it to whoever I want, and I'm not going to take like resumes or whatever else, I'm just going to look, and I'm going to say, I'm going to give it to this person. Is it not my right to say, this is mine, and I will give it to whom I want? If you've done nothing to earn it, I'm, not, I, I'm doling out that money, and I'm not asking you, what program are you going to do? What are you going to spend it on? I'm just saying, here's the money. I have the right to give to whom I want to. I hope that makes sense. It made sense in my mind. Because salvation is entirely about, about God's grace and not by human effort or merit. All humans are fallen and deserving of judgment. God's choice to save some is an act of his profound mercy, not injustice. God's election is part of his hidden will, meaning that we cannot fully understand why he chooses some and not others. But it is consistent with his nature as just and merciful. Deuteronomy 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of his law. God's purposes, while mysterious, are always good and for the ultimate redemption of his people, but we may not understand always why he does what he does. But this all leads to God's love and justice. God is perfectly loving and just. And the fact that not all are chosen does not mean that God is unloving. Rather, we believe that everyone, everyone receives justice. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And those who are chosen receive mercy. God's justice ensures that those who reject him are not wronged as they are receiving the consequence of sin. But we also have a human responsibility. We maintain that humans are still responsible for their response to the gospel. The call of repentance and faith is extended to all, and those who reject it do so willingly. The doctrine of election does not eliminate human responsibility but it does highlight God's role in drawing people to himself. And so in summary, Scripture teaches election as an act of God's sovereign grace, highlighting his mercy and justice while affirming the salva that salvation is ultimately a mystery grounded in his divine will. Which leads us to look at our new life in Christ. The final section of this passage brings us those familiar words from the foundation of the Reformed theology. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Salvation is a gift. It's not something that we can earn through good deeds or religious rituals or moral behavior. Paul explicitly tells us that our works have done nothing to do with our salvation. And this is because if our salvation were based on works, it would lead to pride and boasting. We would inevitably think that we could take credit for our relationship with God. But the gospel humbles us and reminds us that our salvation is entirely a work of God and his grace. But this does not mean that works have no place in the Christian life. In verse 10, Paul tells us <clears throat> that we are his workmanship, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. While our good works do not save us, they are the fruit of our salvation. 
once we are saved, our lives are transformed by the Spirit, and we are empowered to live in a new way that reflects the goodness and the holiness of God. We are God's workmanship, His masterpiece, created for a purpose, to live in a way that brings glory to Him. Paul's point is that just as we contributed nothing to our initial physical creation, Neither do we contribute anything to our spiritual recreation. And this concept of being a creation of God is linked to the anticipation of the age to come when there is a new heaven and a new earth. And so his point here is the same as in 2 Corinthians 5, that they, we are a new creation that is yet to come, has already come in part in God's work in, of salvation in us. In other words, when the Holy Spirit reanimates our dead soul by the power of Christ's work, we are fundamentally changed from dead to alive, from enemy to child, from useless to useful. And the good works we do are not to earn salvation, but to display the reality of God's grace in our lives. Good works are the purpose, not the procuring cause of salvation. Salvation is not by works, but for works. They are a response to the mercy and the love that we have received. And notice that God says in verse 10, even the good works themselves were preordained by God. Good works follow God's work of creating you, making you part of his family, forgiving you, saving you, resurrecting you, bringing you to life, bringing new birth in you. <coughs> the whole point of the beginning of Ephesians 2. There were no good works in us. We were dead, enslaved, powerless, with no desire for God. And God worked a new res a resurrection in our life. He worked new creation in us and put in us a heart of flesh where there had once been a heart of stone. And getting that order wrong and thinking that it is by our works that we are saved will either lead us to moralistic pride like the Pharisees or fear and despair that you can't perform well enough and that you'll live like a slave. My brothers and sisters, fill your mind with this truth so that when you are in the midst of spiritual warfare and Satan is telling you that you are a failure, that you'll respond by saying, you're right. I am a failure, but praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for all that he has done for me. Luther wrote about this, and he said, in facing the accuser, he had this quote. He said, it's the supreme art of the devil that he can make a work out of the gospel. If I can hold on to the distinction between law and works and the gospel, I can say to him any and every time that he should kiss my backside. Once I debate about what I have done and left undone, I am finished. But if I reply on the basis of the gospel, the forgiveness of sins covers it all, I have won. On the one hand, if the devil gets me involved in what I have done and left undone, he has won, unless God helps and says, indeed, even if you have not done anything, you would still have to be saved by forgiveness. Where a new heart now beats, there you will see new affections, new passions, new desires, new pursuits that move towards God into the new life that he has given to us. When he saves us, he doesn't just empty out the junk drawer in your heart. He fills it with his purposes for us, and that overflows into everything in our lives. Because saving grace always bears fruits. That's the point of Jesus' parable when he spoke about the four soils. If you remember, the parable of the sower. Saving grace always produces fruit. Colossians 1, 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 9. And God is able to make, you, make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. 
Now may our Lord Jesus Christ, this is from 2 Thessalonians, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. We've been saved by Jesus' work to do his work. What does this passage mean for us today? How do we apply these truths? First of all, it calls us to have a posture of humility. We must remember where we came from. We must remember that we were dead in our sins, and it is only by God's grace that we are alive in Christ. There's no room for pride or boasting in the Christian life. We should live in a deep sense of gratitude for what God has done for us. And and, and in that gratitude, we should live every day as an opportunity to reflect that grace that we have received and to respond with thanksgiving and and, and to let it permeate our worship and our prayers and our interactions with each other. And we are called to walk in the good works that the Lord has prepared for us. Our lives should be marked by acts of love and service and compassion. We should see these good works not as a burden, but as a joyful response to the love that God has given. They're a form of worship, pointing others to the God who has saved us by his grace. Everyone who is in this room who knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has already been equipped to do these good works for his kingdom. And no good work is unimportant. For us as a church to function properly, we need every individual who is a member or regular tender of this church to exercise the gifts that God has bestowed upon them. I'll just lay out a couple real quick that needs that we have at this church that you can do. And I promise almost every one of us in this church is equipped to do it. First and foremost, we have a bunch of kids. God I am so thankful to see all of those kids every Sunday morning. I've been in churches where there have been no children. It's not good. But Melissa needs nursery help. And you know what? We may not think, oh, I don't want to do that or whatever else. Look, I have the weakest stomach available around here. I, was, I, I still manage to change diapers for my own children. I can do it for others. But we need help there. We need help with the AV team. We need help with setup around the church. Uh, If there's a billion things, no, that's probably, that's an exaggeration. There's a bunch of things that we have needs in this church. And if you don't know what your gift is or talent is, or I don't know how to chime in, or I don't know what to do, come and talk to us. And we will do our best not to put round, round pegs in square holes. But we will work with you. But please come and seek us out. I know that you hear all the time, like, we need this, we need that. We don't particularly like giving that message. (laughs) We would love for you to come and say, I want to serve. I want to serve this church and God's kingdom. Back to Ian and Francis. When Ian was completely freed and able to stand, the two of them shared a long hug. And Ian said, thanks for stopping. You saved a life today. Thank you for saving my life. There are now friends who ski and snowboard together. And Ian says he's different now. I am definitely very grateful to be alive. I notice that everything is a little bit better. Even on a gray day, it's a nice, beautiful gray day. When I'm eating food, everything tastes a little better. I have an appreciation for being alive, breathing, I think about breathing every day now. The fact that I can take a breath without the weight of the snow keeping me from being able to breathe. He pauses. So just the little things we take for granted. Francis is an understated guy. He seems a little embarrassed by the whole thing. But, but he's proud too. Ian says, he saved my life. So no one's done that for me before. And I hope no one has to do it ever again. I'll feel indebted to him forever. I mean, he'll never say that I owe him, but I feel like that. That's why I want to show him everything about the town that I grew up in. You know, every bar, every restaurant, every secret spot so that he can have the best experience possible and then not leave just in case I need him again. 
Brothers and sisters, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 reminds us of the incredible gift that we have been given in Christ. We are dead in sin, but God in his rich mercy has made us alive in Christ. This is the heart of the gospel. Let us live in the light of this grace, humbly acknowledging our need for God, giving thanks to him for his mercy, and walking in the good works that he has prepared us to do. May our lives be a reflection of his grace, and may we continually point others to the one who has brought us from death unto life. Amen and amen.